from time to time, I hear of mechanics who shy away from learning about wheel alignment because they think the whole thing is too hard to understand. Actually, it's not all that complicated and should come easy with a little coaching. And to help me make my point, my good friend Larry has agreed to give us his special simplified explanation of how the various wheel alignment factors tie in with roadability and handling. Once you understand the basics, the rest should be easy. Okay, Larry, turn it on. Thank you, Tech. Actually, the alignment story boils down to understanding how the operating angles of the suspension and steering system parts work to provide good directional stability and easy steering with normal tire wear. Directional stability helps the driver hold a straight course without making continuous steering corrections. Ideally, only very light force at the steering wheel is enough to keep the vehicle headed on a straight course. This directional characteristic provides a slight turning load which stabilizes steering control through turns. It also helps to return the wheels to the straight ahead position when coming out of turns. Some tire rolling friction is required to produce directional stability and steering control. However, when wheel alignment is correct, this friction load is evenly distributed, so we get this control without a lot of tire wear. Now, let's see how the various control factors operate. Beginning with the adjustable alignment angles, we have camber, caster, and toe. The non-adjustable alignment angles are steering axis inclination and toe out on turns. An important thing to remember about alignment angles is that they change with variations of car speed and load. They are also affected by changes in road surface conditions, by cornering forces, starting forces, and braking forces. Actually, the specified angles given in the service manual only apply when the car is at rest. However, these angle settings are established by engineering design and testing to provide the best average running wheel alignment under all road and load conditions. Now, let's define camber. Camber is the inward or outward tilt of the wheels from true vertical, viewed from the front of the car. When tilted outward, away from the center of the car, wheel camber is positive. When tilted inward, the camber angle is negative. Camber action can be described as a built-in compensating factor, which changes wheel tilt to maintain good tire tread contact under varying road and load conditions. If all driving was straight ahead on smooth, flat surfaces, zero camber would be best for maximum tire mileage. You see, when the wheel and tire are vertical and running on a smooth, flat surface, the tire tread area in contact with the road surface is equal side to side. With equal contact area, load and wear are evenly distributed over the full tread width. However, in average driving, we encounter such things as bumps, holes, curves, and road crown. There are side-to-side -side body load shifts on curves, which vary with speed. And we have body tilt, which is affected by passenger loading. So let's see what happens to camber under actual driving conditions. When a front wheel hits a bump, it moves upward in what is called a jounce movement. As the wheel rises, the swing arcs of the suspension control arms cause the top of the wheel to lean inward, producing negative camber. And in a smooth, fast turn, we get the same relative effect at the outside wheel because normal weight shift causes the car body to lean downward, closer to the wheel. In other words, with upward movement of a front wheel or relative downward movement of the body, the camber angle goes negative. Now, in the opposite direction, when a front wheel drops into a hole, the downward movement is called rebound. Rebound action produces zero or a slight positive camber as the swing arcs of the suspension control arms cause the wheel to move inward, top and bottom. And as you might expect, upward body movement produces the same relative effect as when the wheel drops on rebound. This means that we get zero or a slight positive camber at the inside wheel as the body lifts away from the wheel on a fast turn. Some directional stability is involved as the camber changes with wheel jounce or rebound. However, the handling and roadability functions of camber action are most obvious in turns and on crowned road surfaces. 
because a weight shift is added to the wheel movement. Here's what happens. As you know, the car body leans in a turn as a result of centrifugal force. Through the turn, the same force tries to move the entire car sideways toward the outside of the turn, but is resisted by the traction of the tires. To counter this force, the negative camber tilt at the outside wheel helps the intersection of the tire tread dig in and brace itself against sidewise skidding. The downward weight shift on the outside wheel also increases its tire traction and skid resistance. At the same time, the zero or slight positive camber at the inside wheel also adds a bracing force to that of the outside wheel. The tire tread contact is distributed as evenly as possible, but the weight load on the inside wheel is less. And the same stabilizing action helps to counteract road ground drift. Right, Tech. Camber is a factor in controlling directional stability on crowned roads because a tilted wheel tends to roll in the direction of the tilt. With negative camber, the wheel tends to roll inward toward the center of the car. With positive camber, the wheel tends to roll outward. Driving straight on the right side of a crowned road affects the camber in much the same way as a curve in the road does. Here again, the body weight load shift toward the low side causes negative camber at the outside wheel and zero or slight positive camber at the inside wheel. Since the wheel with negative camber tilts inward or uphill on the road crown, it tends to roll uphill and this helps to maintain a straight ahead course on a crowned road. The inside wheel runs near the top of the crown where little camber compensation is needed to resist drift toward the road edge. In addition to the effects of shifting car body weight, Camber is also changed by variations in passenger load or cargo weight. In most cars, the driver alone is the average passenger load. The driver's weight causes the left side of the car to drop slightly lower than the right side. To compensate for this, the camber on the left side is usually set more positive, so both sides tend to equalize. If the driver's weight is excessive, or the right and left wheel camber angles are not correct to begin with, Camber can be off enough to cause some steering pull to one side. The greatest noticeable effect, however, would be uneven tire wear. For example, when the camber angle is excessive because of incorrect setting or bent parts, the load and wear on the tire tread is shifted sideways. If the wheel tilts outward too far, load and wear concentrate at the outer shoulder of the tire. Inward tilt does just the opposite. Even when camber is correct, regular high-speed driving on curves causes cornering tire wear. This resembles camber wear, but is caused by tread roll-under, which results from the heavy side thrust on the tires in a turn. Slowing down is the only remedy for this type of wear. High speed makes tires wear faster, period. Now tell us what happens to roadability and handling if the camber is out of specs. Uh, incorrect camber can cause hard steering, unstable steering, steering wander, and of course, excessive tire wear. Now let's define caster. Caster is the rearward or forward tilt of the steering axis from true vertical as viewed from the side of the wheel. Tilted rearward at the top, the caster angle is positive. Tilted forward, the angle is negative. The steering axis is the center line through the upper and lower ball joints, or on some trucks, through the kingpin center line. Caster is basically a directional stability factor, which helps to keep the car on a straight course, to straighten the wheels when coming out of turns, and to make steering easier. Caster has little effect on tire wear. The working principle of automotive caster is similar to that of a tool cabinet caster, where the wheel follows the direction of caster spindle movement. The wheel fork pivots freely on a vertical caster spindle to make directional movement and control easy. When the cabinet is pushed in any direction, the caster spindle axis leads the wheel axis, so the caster fork pivots until the wheel lines up in the direction of motion. You can visualize this relationship by extending the spindle and wheel center lines to the rolling surface. Hold up, Larry. We're running out of sound. So if someone will turn the record, We'll continue with our story.
The spindle axis of the cabinet caster is vertical, so there is little resistance to wheel directional change. But if the spindle is tilted, its turning axis is then partly horizontal. So the load on the fork tends to keep the wheel rolling in a straight line. You see, if you turn the caster on a tilted spindle, it produces a downward movement as it turns. Since the wheel cannot move below the rolling surface, the turning force raises the caster spindle upward against the resistance of the vertical load. On a car, the steering or caster axis is also tilted, so turning the wheels tends to lift the body. However, steering axis inclination, which we'll explain farther on, and tire rolling friction provide most of the directional control. So we use a relatively small amount of caster angle, mainly for steering control. Now, in power steering cars, the power gear helps to hold the wheels on course, either straight ahead or on curves. Because of this, we need more directional force to make the wheels return to the straight ahead position. So we use positive caster. As the caster angle is moved in the positive direction, the steering axis center line moves ahead of the tread contact center. This increases the lead force and produces greater wheel returnability. It also increases steering effort, but the power gear takes care of that. In comparison, on manual steering cars, negative caster is used to keep the steering effort as low as possible. In this case, positive caster would add to the steering effort, especially at low speeds, where the tread contact friction has its greatest effect. Here's what happens. Negative caster puts the steering axis center line behind the tread contact area center. Here, the axis center trails the contact center, so the directional force developed by tire friction helps to change the wheel steering direction. Now, since caster action is amplified by tire rolling friction, Incorrect caster can seriously affect rotability and handling. With power steering, too much positive caster can cause low speed shimmy, increased road shock to the wheel, and high speed wander. With manual steering, positive caster raises the steering effort. Caster is affected by changes in suspension height, front and rear. These changes can be caused by variation in height adjustment, by installation of new or incorrect parts, or by cargo or passenger load variations. Here are some examples. Caster moves in the positive direction with reduced front suspension height, or in the negative direction with increased height. In both cases, we assume that rear suspension height does not change. New or stiffer rear springs will raise the rear end of the car, and this changes the caster angle in the negative direction. The caster change is even more pronounced when high lift shackles or spring helpers are used. Obviously, if one spring is stiffer than the other, the rear suspension height will be uneven, and so will the caster. This explains why springs should be replaced in pairs, and how one sagging rear spring can change caster enough to cause steering drift. Now, when a heavy load is carried regularly in the rear compartment, it causes the rear suspension height to decrease below normal. In this case, the caster changes in the positive direction. The final adjustable angle on our list is toe. Toe in means that the wheels and tires are closer together at the front than at the rear. The wheels have toe out when they are farther apart at the front. All right, Larry, I'll ask the obvious question. Why do we need a toe setting? Well, as I mentioned earlier, alignment angles change with load and wheel-toe is no exception. In effect, we adjust for toe-in with the car at rest, so we won't have toe-out when the car is running. You see, under operating conditions, tire rolling resistance and brake applications produce forces which try to push the tie rods and steering linkage inward. This causes movement in the toe-out direction, so our basic toe-in setting actually near zero alignment when the car is underway. Just remember that toe out can cause steering wander. Of course, too much wheel toe in either direction will cause a serious tire wear problem. That takes care of the adjustables. Now tell us about steering axis inclination. Okay, Tech. We've got a good start on the function of steering axis inclination in the caster story, but 
Here we are concerned with the inward tilt of the axis line through the ball joints as viewed from the front of the car. As with caster, the effect of the car weight on the steering axis angle helps the wheels to stay on a straight course and to return when coming out of turns. Since this angle is greater, it has a greater effect on directional stability than the caster angle. In addition, steering axis inclination also reduces steering effort because it puts the turning axis center line of the ball joints near the center of the tire tread contact area. I know what you mean, Larry, but you'd better spell that out a little more. Now let's do it by comparison, Tech. If the steering axis was vertical, its turning center would extend to the road surface at some distance from the tire tread contact area center. Here, the steering effort would be high because the full tread contact surface would scrub sideways, resisting the steering force. With the steering axis inclined, the turning center is closer to the tread contact area center. As a result, we have less tread contact area moving sideways and less scrubbing friction to overcome when turning the steering wheel. Before we go any farther, I'd like to mention that the steering axis inclination angle is designed into the steering knuckle. The angle will not change unless the knuckle is bent. And then, the only answer is a new part. All right, Larry, it's time to explain toe-out on turns. Okay, Tech. Like steering axis inclination, toe-out on turns is a non-adjustable, designed-in alignment factor. It controls the tracking of the front wheels in turns to minimize side-slipping and tire-scuffing wear. Theoretically, all four wheels should roll around a common center in a turn. Both rear wheels are in fixed alignment with the rear axle, so the front wheels should turn on circles whose center lines intersect the center line of the rear axle. Since the inside wheel rolls around a smaller circle than the outside wheel, it must have a sharper turning angle to follow the inside circle. To get this relative movement, the steering arms are angled away from the tire center lines. In the straight ahead position, the right and left steering arms are in different positions on their operating arcs. Neither arm is parallel to its wheel, so equal tie rod travel produces a different turning angle at each wheel. When the wheels are turned in either direction, the arm on the inside wheel travels through that part of its operating arc where a small amount of arm movement produces a relatively large amount of wheel turning movement. At the same time, the arm on the outside wheel moves away from its high point. This produces less wheel turning movement, so we have the difference in wheel angles. Now, right here I'm going to sidetrack a little and make a few comments on mixing radial ply and conventional tires and the effects this has on rotability and handling. The general rule is no mixed pairs, and here's why. Radial ply tire sidewalls are more flexible, so they can keep more tread in contact with the road surface, especially when under side thrust in turns. With stiffer sidewalls, conventional tire shoulders tend to lift on similar turns. From this, it is easy to see that mixing tires creates a side-to-side -side traction difference. If a radial ply tire is paired with a conventional tire on the front wheels, the car will pull to the side with a radial tire, and braking will be likewise affected. Even when radials are paired, rotability and handling can still be affected. For example, when radial ply tires are used only on the front wheels, the relatively lower traction at the rear can result in skidding or rear-end steering in turns. All good points, Larry. Now, how about a quick review? Just what I had in mind, Tech. Let's go back to the various alignment angles in the order that they were covered. Camber is the inward or outward tilt of the wheels from true vertical, viewed from the front of the car. Caster is the rearward or forward tilt of the steering axis from true vertical, as viewed from the side of the wheel. Toe-in means that the wheels and tires are closer together at the front than at the rear. The wheels have toe-out when they are farther apart at the front. Steering axis inclination is the inward tilt of the axis line through the ball joints as viewed from the front of the car. Toe out on turns is a non-adjustable designed in alignment factor which controls the tracking of the front wheels in turns. 
Thank you, Larry. I couldn't have put the whole thing more simply myself. Now that you've explained what wheel alignment really is, we should have more master technicians tackling these jobs. We've hit the high spots of basic wheel alignment in this session, but you'll need the specs and adjustment information in your service manuals to complete the story. And don't forget to read through your reference books. Well, that's it, fellas. See you all at the next meeting.